shall not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Father, we just lift up our hearts and our minds to you tonight. God, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy and for your kindness and your faithfulness, Lord, to each one of us. Lord, we just declare, Lord, over our own souls and over one another and to you, Father, Lord, that we've come here, Lord, to encounter you, Lord. We've come, Lord, because we want, Lord, to drink from your river of life, Lord. We want to eat, Lord, the bread of life, Lord, that you so freely give to us. Father, I pray, Lord, that as the word of the Lord goes forth, God, that you would penetrate our hearts, Lord, that you would open us up to an encounter with you, God, that you would feed us. Lord, and that you would give to us something to drink as we are thirsty, God. Thank you, Lord, that as your children, Lord, that when we ask, Lord, for bread, Lord, that you do not give stones, but you give us bread and you give us bread abundantly. And so, God, I just, I pray, Lord, that as, as we move on tonight, God, as we continue in worship, Lord, with, with your word, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, that you would change us and transform us, Lord, by the power of your word, Lord, that you would make us more like your son, Jesus. Or that you would open us up to an encounter with the love of the Father. These things we pray, amen. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. How many were here last night? Amen. Tonight, last night was a good night. Last night was a good time. The Lord, the Lord really did a lot of really cool things, and a lot of people received some healing, physical healing, internal healing. The Lord imparted some fresh vision to people. We just talked about the, the furnace of encounter or the wilderness of intimacy that the Lord is drawing the church into in this season of our lives. Whether you had been in the wilderness before and the Lord was drawing you back or whether you had never been there and the Lord was beckoning you to come so that He can encounter you with His love. Those different groups of people we had. and um, I was just really excited um, just at the response. Just that, just uh, just watching the Lord work in the hearts of people, you know, just as someone sharing the word, it's always encouraging if someone responds to your message. <laughs> it's not always a guarantee. Amen. Well, um, I want to talk tonight uh, out of John 4. Victoria, if you can throw up the, the text in John 4 for us. Um, I feel like the Lord wants to talk to us about two different wells tonight. I feel like the Lord really wants to mark hearts with His Word. He wants to impart more of His Spirit to us, or He wants to make us more aware of God's presence in our life. I'm getting some feedback, I think. Sorry. No? Okay. Sorry. And um, I think the Lord is really asking us, my prayer for us tonight is, as we listen to the word is that we would really examine our own hearts. I'm going to be examining my heart even as I share it and really asking the Lord to reveal to me the things in my life that need to go. The things in, in my life that the Lord wants to deal with or sort out in his loving kindness so that he can open me up to receive more from him and to give more of him away to those around me. And so I just believe that the cry of God's heart in the earth right now is for a people that would just be fascinated with His beauty, fascinated with His holiness, fascinated with a longing and a, and a desire to worship Him, to make His name famous in the earth. Yes. I really believe that. It's the cry of my heart, my heart, Josiah's heart, the cry of my heart is that the name of Jesus would be glorified in the earth, that God would be lifted up and, and that God would... Do that through the church because it's where, it, where it's going to come from. We talked last night about how the greatest miracle sign and wonder in the end of the age is not going to be the dead being raised or the blind eye being opened, but it's going to be the restoration of the church and the power and the authority that's coming forth in the name of Jesus from her. God is raising up a lovesick bride that is in love with him. God is not coming back for what we talked about last night. God's not coming back for that tattered prostitute crawling to the finish line. God is coming back for a glorious bride who is ready to receive him, who is longing for his return. I just feel like the Lord is going to, tonight is going to remove things from us that hinder us from longing for him to come again. We do not long for the return of the Lord Jesus as much as we should or we could. 
because of the other things in our hearts that get in the way that we end up longing for. You will worship whatever you behold. Whatever it is that you give most of your time to, you will worship that thing, that person. Whatever you give all of your heart to, your emotion to, your money to, you're worshiping that thing. I really believe that everything that we do in life as a people is worship. It's worshiping something or someone in one, in one way or another. Your emotions, your time, your money, your energy, whatever you give your thoughts to, whatever you give your, your heart to, whatever you give your love to, that is the thing that you will worship. Spend time with the Lord, you'll worship the Lord. Spend all your time at work, you'll worship your job. Spend all your time with your spouse, you'll end up worshiping your spouse. I'm so thankful for my wife, and I'm not going to say I talk about marriage because you guys found out last night I've been married for six weeks today. Woo! 42 days. But me and my wife, we talk about all the time, just as much as we love one another and we want to spend time with one another, there's got to be that separation where she can spend time with the Lord and receive from the Lord, and I can do the same. We're going to read this account in John chapter 4 um, of Jesus at, at the well of Jacob and the Samaritan woman. Let's, uh, John chapter 4 verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing but his disciples were, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me to, for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Verse 11, She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Circle that word well in your Bible if you have it, or pay attention to that word well, okay? That word well, the Hebrew Greek translation of that word is a word called freer, freer, E-H-R-E-A-R. -E the translation of that word is this, a deep hole, a cistern, an abyss, or a prison, something used to hold. Verse 12, you are not greater than our father Jacob, are you who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well. Everybody say well. Well. Of water springing up to eternal life. Circle that word well. This second word well is not the same word as the well from before. This well comes from a word called pege, P-E-G-E. -E. The translation of that word is this, a plumply gushing source or supply of water, blood, and enjoyment. So here we are, we have this Samaritan woman, she's there at the well of Jacob, the well of her fathers. Jesus comes and says to the Samaritan woman, Woman, give me, draw me something to drink. He wasn't speaking derogatory towards her. Dear woman, <laughs> give me something to drink. Yeah. I wanna, don't don't want to paint Jesus out to be barking orders at women. He doesn't talk to us. <laughs> as much as I might want to talk to my wife. <laughs> so Jesus says, Woman, give me something to drink. And she says, Who are you? You, you shouldn't be associating with me. And Jesus says to her, Hey, that well that you're drinking from, this hole in the ground, this cistern, this abyss, this prison that you're drinking from, has nothing to offer you, but I have something to give you to drink that will offer you eternal life. Now, this is what I really like a lot, and this is why I love the Word of God, and I'm really excited because I just got a brand new Greek keyword study Bible. My dad bought it for me, God bless him, and I've just been using it like crazy. 
If you go to Revelation 21 in verse 6, you don't have to go there, but just listen with me. Revelation 21, 6. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. That word spring is also the word pege. It's the same word as well. If you're taking notes, three things that God is bringing forth and releasing to and through those who are thirsty and those who are hungry for Him in the Salmon. Three things. One, the river of the Holy Spirit. Two, the blood of Jesus. And three, the enjoyment or the delight of the Father's heart. I've been just going over this account in John chapter 4, reading it, going back to but going back to verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Reading that word, the well, the spring, pege, just thinking, okay, God, what are you releasing to us in the earth right now? And the Lord said, I'm releasing three things. I'm releasing the river of the Holy Spirit, the blood of Jesus, and the enjoyment or delight of the Father's, the Father's heart. I just started to get really excited. I just was like, you know what, Lord? You're releasing new rivers in your people. You're releasing the river, the word of life. You know, sorry, guys. Verse fifteen. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water. So I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people as the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So here we are in our lives, just longing for the Lord. We're in the end of the age. We're believing that God is coming back. We're asking the Lord to encounter us. We're really longing. How many of us really are just longing to encounter the Lord in our lives? We want more of His love. We want more of His mercy. We want more of His kindness. We want to be able to receive from Him and give Him away to other people. But we can't do it as much as we want to or there's a block in our lives because there are things inside of us. There's a well inside of us that's not that well. There's a contending well that's contending with the well or the spring of living water or the river of life inside of us. And really just in short tonight, guys, I don't know how long we're going to go. I went for an hour last night and the Lord did all kinds of stuff. I'm not up here trying to repeat. I'm not up here trying to create anything. I'm not up here to do anything. I just want to do whatever it is that the Lord wants to do. If it's five minutes or 50 more, I really don't care. That was kind of my silence right there. I'll be transparent. I just came here to Ocala believing the Lord said, go there because I want to release my river into those people. I want to stir up the gift of God inside of them and I want to call out to them and ask them to begin to burn for my name or continue burning for my name. And the only way that we can really 
burn for the Lord. The only way that the, the river of living water really begins to stir up and flow out of us is when we choose to deny the culture, when we choose to deny the things of the world that just, they so easily entangle us. And we get in this place of water and we say, God, we must have an encounter with you. Last night we talked about the wilderness. We Hallelujah. talked about the fiery furnace and the encounter. And so tonight I want to talk about what happens when you get into the furnace and what happens when you get into the wilderness is that God begins to mark your heart, set you apart, and encounter you. But that encounter has a requirement that comes with it. And I'm not talking about religious obligation or duty. I'm not here to sign you up for anything or enlist you into anything. But I do believe that God is raising up an army in the church and he's releasing a militant strike against the kingdoms of darkness that are going to come through the church in these last days. Amen? Amen. He is. He's doing it. But in order for that to happen, in order to really be able to be the soldier in Christ that we want to be in again, I want to caution us and just share my own heart. When I talk about the army of the Lord and being a soldier for Christ, I don't want to sign us up or pound us with obligation and duty and say, you got to serve, you got to get it right, don't be afraid, go out to battle and do what you need to do. I'm saying that God is healing the church, restoring her, and raising us up to our place of authority in Him, where therefore we are not required or asked to negotiate with the kingdoms of darkness, but we are asked to drive them out by the power of the name of Jesus. A lot of us came forward last night or, or, or just said, hey Lord, I'm in the wilderness, I want to come back to the wilderness, I want to be in that fiery furnace. Okay, now here we are the next day, we're in the furnace of encounter. What happens in that place? God begins to chasten us, God begins to address and expose every little thing inside of us. I was having a conversation with my brother Jeremiah the other day, and he sent me a text message and just said, hey, where God is taking the church right now, where we're moving forward into and the greatness that God has reserved for the church, he's not going to let us take our nonsense with us. He's going to address that nonsense inside of us. He's going to heal it. He's going to remove it. He's going to release his wholeness in his life. And then he's going to make sure that we're prepared to do battle with the things that are coming to us. Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We begin reading in verse 1. Now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the Munites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, out of Aram, and behold, they are in Hazan Tamar, that is, in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Verse 5, Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, art thou not God in the heavens? And art thou not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in thy hand, so that no one can stand against thee. Didst thou not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and give it to the descendants of Abraham, thy friend forever? And they lived in it, and have built thee a sanctuary there for thy name, saying, Should evil come upon us, the sword, or judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before thee, for thy name is in this house, and cry to thee in our distress, and thou wilt hear and deliver us. The church is crying out for the Lord to come. The church is crying out, asking God to move. We want your spirit to come. We want our sick to be healed. We want the hospitals to be emptied out. We want the jails to be emptied out. We want the crime rates to go down. We want abortion to end. We want the homosexuality, the, the, the agenda to be dealt with. We want those people set free and healed and saved and encountered by the love of the Father. And this is the response of the Lord to the cry of the church in this hour. To a people without mixture, I will give my spirit without measure. Come on. Oh. The Lord is saying, I want to pour out the fullness of my heart upon the church. I have every intention. I'm more than able. I'm more than capable. I'm more than willing. But it requires something on our part. Because he knows that if he 
poured out his fullness on us right now, it would crush us. It would flatten us like a pancake because we're not ready, beloved. But praise God, we're getting ready. Yes. Yeah. This is a season of preparation in the church. We talk in Lincoln all the time about this prophetic word that came forth and said that everything that we do in 2012 is going to position us for the rest of our lives and for the next years of our lives. God is calling to a lot of us in this city of Ocala, in Marion County, whether you're going to do the house of prayer or you belong to another church or you're just stopping by, whatever it is. God is calling out to the church in Central Florida, in this region, all over the earth, and saying, get ready and get prepared because I am certainly going to pour out my spirit on the church. I am certainly going to do what I said I would do in Acts 2, which I, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and blood. Your sons and daughters, they're going to prophesy. Your old men are going to dream dreams. Your young men are going to have visions. This, is, this wasn't... It's a promise from the Lord saying, I'm going to do it. I'm going to pour out my spirit on the church. I'm going to raise her up to be this beautiful, bright, shining bride of Christ. But that requires something from us. We need to be able to participate. And I feel like the Lord is saying to some of us tonight, it's time to get off the bench and get in the game. Pick up the ball and start playing again. Some of us are wounded by the church. Some of us are wounded by our parents. We're wounded by our situation in life. We don't understand. We're confused. We're discouraged. The Spirit of the Lord is saying, I will not confuse you. I will not discourage you. I will heal you. I will help you. I am for you and not against you. My heart is to see you come into the fullness of my glory and walk in the destiny that I have for you. Before the foundation of the earth, I laid out something for you in this life. That would attribute to my greatness and my glory in the earth. Amen. Come on. And I'm going to reveal it to you. All I'm asking you to do is to ask me. Yeah. We talked last night about asking the right questions, right? Yeah. There's a difference between questioning God and asking God questions. Yeah. I think for some of us, our destiny right now is dependent on asking God the right questions. I flip my page with my violent wind. <laughs> Verse 10, chapter 20. And now behold, the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou did not let Israel invade, when they came out of the land of Egypt, they turned aside from them and did not destroy them. Behold how they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out from thy possession, which thou hast given us as an inheritance. O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on thee. And all Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. Verse 14. Then in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah, the Levite, and the sons of Asaph. And he said, listen, all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Does this sound familiar to anybody? Do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. It's the exact same thing that David said to the Israelites when Goliath was mocking the army of the Lord. The church right now, some of us, some entire denominations, some entire churches, a lot of cities in the earth, we are frozen, we are paralyzed in fear. We're paralyzed with fear, the fear of our future, the fear of our destiny, the fear of the unknown, the fear of what if, the fear of this, that, and the other, the fear of all the things. Is it going to happen again? Will it repeat? I don't know. I'm just afraid. God is releasing prophetic voices. Excuse me. God is releasing prophetic voices in the earth that are declaring to the people of God, do not be afraid, for the battle is not yours, but the battle belongs to the Lord. We're going to see what that really looks like. Verse 
Verse 16, Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Jeruel. You need not fight in this battle. Station yourselves. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites from the sons of the Kohathites and the sons of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. They went, and when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, O Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in his holy attire as they went out before the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And when they began singing and praising the Lord, and praising, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so they were routed. For the sons of Ammon and Moab rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, destroying them completely. And when they had finished with the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. When Judah came to the lookout of the wilderness, they looked forward toward the multitude, and behold, there were corpses lying on the ground, and no one had escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found much among them, including goods, garments, and valuable things, which they took for themselves more than they could carry. And they were three days taking the spoil because there was so much. Did you catch where this entire encounter happened? The wilderness. Here comes the army of the enemy, taunting, harassing, encroaching, threatening. I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to take all of it. I'm going to enslave you. You're going to go back to that life you once lived. You're going to fall back into a lifestyle of fear. You're going to fall back into a lifestyle of that. You're going to continue to be bored. You're going to continue to be hopeless. You're going to continue to be shamed and condemned. They cry out to the Lord, help us. God raises up a messenger and a prophet says, do not be afraid. The, the Lord's answer to the crisis is, worship me and watch what I will do. They go into the wilderness. They begin rejoicing, thanksgiving, worshiping the Lord. The Lord strikes the camp of the enemy and the enemy begins to destroy itself. I, I really would just love to be like on a mountaintop. Watching a military battle, and what? And here comes this, where this little army. So let's just say, here it is. As the way that we view ourselves, so many times, the, the, here we are, the little, the poor little helpless church of God. Here we are. We're just, oh Lord, please come and help us. And here comes this big, huge army of the enemy. And the Lord says, okay, now just cry out and worship me. The Lord strikes the enemy, and they just begin to slaughter one another, and the people just begin to stand there and rejoice more wildly than they started rejoicing in the first place. There are so many situations and things that people are dealing with. There are things that are approaching the church right now. You have the issue of abortion. You've got the issue of homosexual marriage. You've got all these different kinds of things that are creeping into the church, that are threatening our convictions, the things that we believe, the lifestyles that we, we believe are biblical and we want to, want to live, the way that we raise our families, the way that we, we have our marriages set up, the way that we have our Christian businesses set up, and we're afraid. And God is saying, I want you to worship me because I'm going to deliver the church from the world. I'm going to deliver the church of the world. I am drawing the church back out into the wilderness to separate her from culture, to separate her from the things of the world. Jesus said what? Be in the world, not of the world. But somehow along the way, we have allowed culture to dictate to us as a people how we live, the way that we do things. It's supposed to be the other way around, beloved. We are supposed to be the example to the world of how we should live and the way things should be. And that day is coming 
When there will be no culture of the world, there will only be a culture of kingdom. The kingdom of God, the honor of the Lord. The Lord is drawing us into the wilderness. It's like, man, are you mean really the wilderness? Like, I don't, you know, what is that? And I'm not saying that it's like we all need to move into the, the national forest of Ocala and, you know, live in tents and separate ourselves and be a bunch of Jesus hippies. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the invitation from the hand of the Lord right now is come out from these things of the world that are so less fascinating, that are so less tasteful. We're singing about Revelation 4. We talked about it last night. We'll go there again. Right now, in heaven, there is a very real throne, and God the Father is sitting on that throne with Jesus Christ next to him, making intercession for the nations. You've got 24 elders with crowns on their heads. They're bowing down and worshiping the Lord. The elders of God represent the wisdom of God. So what is God saying? That it is the wisdom of God to worship God. You want to be a wise man? You want to be a wise woman? Spend your life, waste your life worshiping Jesus. Wisdom, real wisdom, the wisdom from heaven is embracing the name of God, worshiping the name of God, living a lifestyle that gives to the Lamb the reward of His suffering. The whole point of everything that we do in this life, if, if you get anything out of what this young preacher says, get this. That you were made for the glory of the Lord. You were made to worship God. You were made to, to love Him, to be loved by Him. Mark 12, 30, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Yes. I want to live my life every day loving the Lord with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, with all my strength. I want to know what the four living creatures who are covered with eyes inside and out, why do they worship? For from the beginning, before the beginning, they were there in the throne room worshiping God. They're still doing it. We worship God for 15 minutes or for an hour or five minutes or two hours, and we need a break. When we pass from this life to the next, when Jesus puts the, the sky and comes for his bride, guess what? The eternal reality of worship is going to kick in, and that's all you're ever going to do for the rest of your life. And you're not going to get bored, trust me. And I don't even know what I'm talking about. I mean, I, I'm, I get some taste of the Lord, and I, I'm not just, I mean, I cry, I fall down drunk in the Lord, just, I mean, just, uh, just a little taste, and the Lord laughs at me. Just says, you have no idea. Your little carnal body is just a little taste. We're so easily fascinated, beloved. I even believe that on this side of heaven, on this side of life, where we're living in the earth, that God wants to make us a long-winded people. Yes. He wants to extend the, con the, the concentration of the people. There are way too many people in the earth, in schools, high schools, and colleges, they take medication because they've been diagnosed with ADD or ADHD. Well, you know what? If you weren't so stuffed on cartoons, YouTube, videos, video games, the internet, whatever it is that you're doing, you wouldn't be so ADD. I'm not yelling at anybody. I'm saying we are so distracted with the things of this life. It's why we don't have a taste for the kingdom of God. It's why we don't have a taste for the kingdom of the Lord. I want to encourage you. I'm just being transparent for a second. I'm a guy, I'm 25 years old. I've probably seen a couple thousand movies in my life. I mean, growing up, I was just a TV junkie. I was an athlete, and I watched movies. I went to the movies, whatever. The last year or so of my life, and definitely in the last few months, and then the last month, the last 30 days knowing I was going to come here, I went on a straight-up media fast. No movies. Batman came out, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> And I wanted to go. I wanted to go until I woke up the next morning after the grand opening and I realized that somebody who was just a little bit deranged and a little bit fascinated with the wrong things took a bunch of weapons to a movie theater and shot up a bunch of people and killed them and ended their lives. How would you like the end of your life to be? I went to be falsely fascinated and then I never came back and did anything else the rest of my life. 
My desire to be fascinated with earthly things got me killed. Hey, I'm not judging anybody. I'm not saying that anybody at that movie theater deserved to die here in my heart. Wrong place at the wrong time. I don't want to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I want to be in the right place at the right time. The right place at the right time is in the presence of God, beholding His beauty, beholding His glory, engaging Him in worship, engaging Him in prayer, engaging Him in relationships that are beneficial to His name and to our own souls. That's a lifestyle of worship, beloved. God is raising up worshipers in the earth. Worshipers. And it doesn't matter if you're a musician or a singer. It doesn't matter if you can sing a lick. If you're a housewife, if you're a businessman, if you own a landscape company or you're a pastor or whatever it is that you do and you can't sing, you can't play, to me, that is like one of the simplest expressions of worship. It is worship, but on the scale of, of things in the eyes of the Lord, let me tell you what worship really is. Worship is telling the truth when nobody's looking. Worship is integrity. Worship is being faithful to my wife. Worship is being respectful to the people I work with. Worship is not gossiping, not lying, not letting profane or sarcastic things come out of my mouth. Worship is loving my children the way that the Father loves me and not being short with them or mad at them or angry with them. That's worship. We're, we're worshipers. You were made for worship. I was listening to this guy named Ray Hughes. Anybody ever heard of Ray Hughes? I was listening to Ray Hughes the other night talking about worship, watching the Bethel stream. And he was talking, I mean, this guy just has like, and his crazy amounts of revelation on the subject of worship and, and the way that it works. And he was talking about worshiping God on our knees with our head down to the ground and the importance of getting down and humbling ourselves before the Lord because it's the only time when your mind is lower than your heart. When your head comes below your heart, so then the intellect of your mind is not keeping you from worshiping God. The practical and rational things that you can't understand, the, your, your practicality and your rationale, they keep us from worshiping God sometimes. When you get down on that place and you're on your face and you've humbled yourself before the Lord, the practicality goes out the windows. You know what? The greatest moves of the Spirit in the earth, they were burnt out of men whose faces were on the ground. The mind goes out the window. It's being transformed as the heart is lifted up to the Lord. We were made to worship. From dust we came, to dust we shall return. We return to the dust and we worship the Lord, we humble ourselves, and we say, Father, fill us, and He begins to fill us. God is doing away with the intellectualism in the church. He's doing away with the practicalities, the humanism, the postmodernism, excuse me. I'm serious. Some of us are like, what's humanism? Let me tell you what humanism is. Humanism is anything and everything. Even in the name of the Lord that exalts itself, it's the worship of that which has been created over the Creator. You, we want, so we want justice in the church, social justice. We want the ending of abortion, the ending of human trafficking, the ending of the crime rate. We want, we want God to just the goodness of God to be the only thing we know and see. And in our humanity. We have, even in the name of the Lord in so many different places in the earth, attempted to end these issues or bring some kind of answer to it with our own minds. Let me tell you what justice is. Anything that's done in the name of the Lord. If you feed a homeless person, and it's not in the name of the Lord, but it's out of your own name and out of, you think that you've done something great, it's a stench to the Lord. As much as the man next door viewing pornography for 12 hours a day. That's not that's a hard one to choke. It's a hard one to, wow, I mean, this guy's crazy. I might be. But I'm telling you right now. Jesus. Justice, if it's not Jesus, it's not justice. If it doesn't result in the Son of Man being lifted up and glorified, then it is as much a stench to the Lord as everything else that we consider to be so vainly and fragrantly sin in the church. But we don't look at it that way. 
We have classifications for sin in the church. This brother is worse than this brother because he picks up hookers and he, excuse my language.
It's not we get saved, but the Lord saves us, and now it's on our own to develop our own holiness and righteousness so that we can become something for the Lord so that He will approve of us and then be tempted to be nice to us and pour out His love on us. No, He saves us, sets us free, fills us with the Holy Spirit, and sets us up to be great lovers to the Father. Amen? Yeah. Let's stand on your feet.
Go and encourage that person. Go be encouraged by someone else. Just wanted to say thank you for, uh, for having us in from Lakeland. Uh, we'll be praying for you guys in Ocala, really believing that God is really doing a really cool thing in this city. Pray for us in Lakeland as we continue to pursue the things of the Lord. We'll be praying for you guys in Ocala, really looking forward to the relationship that, uh, that God is building between this house and Heart of the Father ministry in Lakeland. I really believe that. That if anything is that the Lord really is bending or, or building relationships between the hearts of the churches in, in the different cities in Central Florida because God is doing something really cool. And so thank you guys very much. Love you.